I have the distinct privilege to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Though I have only known her for a short amount of time, Jenny, I feel like we've been friends for forever. <laughs> what I just absolutely love is the authenticity that Pastor Jenny brings. She is an absolute gem of an individual, and I know that her heart is going to be shared this morning as she brings the word. And so, hey, can we give a big Stone Creek welcome to Pastor Jenny Baines? Good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to be back in Stone Creek. Some of you will have known me from, I've been back and forth now, I think seven or eight times over the last 12 years. I can't believe it's 12 years since I first came out here. I'm getting so old. My hair's a different color now, you might have noticed. <laughs> um, but it's really so good to be back. And some of you will have heard a lot, some of my story probably several times, and some of you won't know me at all. Um, so I'm going to share a little of that this morning, um, but just want to say how, what a privilege it is um, to be here back with you in Stone Creek. Um, so I'm from um, England, you might guess from the accent, um, and I'm from Lincolnshire, which is a beautiful um, rural county, one of the biggest counties in England. It's about 100 miles north um, of London. It is actually the county that people don't tend to go to unless they've got a reason, <laughs> but it is actually beautiful, um, really lovely part of England. And just a little bit about me, for over 30 years um, I've been involved in working with those who have faced um, a crisis pregnancy or maybe struggling following an experience of pregnancy loss. And we've been doing a little bit of work around that um, this week um, and we're going to be doing some next week. Before that I worked as a social worker um, until I met and married my husband Derek. I'm not going to share too much of my story today, some of you will have heard it. But my my husband, he was a Baptist pastor, which was a bit of a challenge, you know, marrying a Baptist pastor. Um, but in addition to that, an even greater challenge was the fact um, that he was a widower um, and he had five young children. So if I had more time and was sharing my full story, I'd be putting up pictures of Julie Andrews, you know, coming over the hills, singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music, um, marrying my Captain Von Trapp, who sadly wasn't a wealthy captain, he was just a poor vicar. Um, but anyway... <laughs> And so from then on, and then we, um, we had tw twins, we started doing it in twos, we had twins and then we had another little girl, so we actually raised eight children. My youngest daughter Alice spent a year over here with her husband Joe, some of you will know Alice and Joe, that's as she used to describe herself, the baby of the family. Um, so that's me, I always, life was very interesting, we were a family of ten, um, and uh, I always say that at that point in my life I exchanged community social work for residential childcare. <laughs> because that's a little bit what it felt like. <clears throat> and then for over 20 years, Derek and I led churches until sadly um, he died very suddenly following a massive heart attack uh, 15 years ago, completely out of the blue. And some of you will have heard me share about that, that in the, in the, in the space of two or three minutes, the whole trajectory of my life changed, actually. Um, that was 15 years ago. Um, and I'm now working uh, as a consultant for a, a Christian charity called CARE. It's very well known in the UK. Um, it's a charity which works with politicians, it works in, with, in Parliament, and it speaks out on issues which we as Christ followers would be concerned about. It prepares policy papers for MPs, um, and it's really a wonderful charity to be working with. But my role within CARE is working as a consultant for an initiative called OPEN, um, which seeks to help churches create environments within the church family um, where these sensitive issues that I've just mentioned can be spoken about with grace and with compassion and where people can share their stories without fear um, of being judged. Um, and that isn't, we're not there in churches to enlist workers, to get volunteers, to get money. We are there to serve the church, to help them. How can they make their churches welcome environments and open environments where we talk um, about these things? Um, to reach out to those in our church families who may have experienced this and yet sadly feel that church is the last place they can talk about it. But I don't know about you, but I believe it should be the first place <laughs> that we talk about these issues. And so our heart is to serve the church with that. 
Um, I'm not going to be st talking specifically about those issues this, this morning, but I will be mentioning just one or two things that we've got coming up here in Stone Creek next week um, later on. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about traveling mercies. Um, I, um, I just love this saying, actually, it reminds me of my grandmother, anywhere we went, anywhere, she would pray for travelling mercies for us. Um, I've been thinking a little bit about what I sh we should talk about, and I kept coming back to the story that we're going to look at in a minute, which usually we do look at after Easter, but it's really relevant, of course, as all scripture, uh, to any, any time of the year, because I wanted to think about and to talk about walking alongside others, um, on this journey that we call life. So I was thinking about journeys. Now, it's a little ironic that I'm talking about this this morning because um, on Tuesday, I boarded the plane at Heathrow Airport in London um, and my two bag, my two suitcases, my luggage, I had all faith that that would come with me on the same place, um, on the same plane. When we arrived in Chicago, just a few minutes before, I guess they didn't want to riot on the plane, um, an announcement came over the speaker that 140 cases hadn't been loaded onto the plane and two of those were mine, a, a bigger bag and then just a carry on, which foolishly I just checked in at the last minute. And so just to let you know, in case you're worried, one of those suitcases, where both of them went via, from Chicago to Indianapolis. One of them actually arrived here, my small case, on Thursday, but the other one has done a bit of a jolly and has been on a trip to Memphis in Tennessee. <laughs> And it's now, I'm told this morning, uh, I'm told that it is now back in Bloomington and should be delivered tomorrow. So I thought it was kind of ironic that I'm talking about travelling mercies when my luggage has been travelling all over uh, the US. <laughs> but anyway, I was thinking about journeys <clears throat> and how years ago, um, when I was an adult and I was um, about to return home from visiting my wonderful parents, my mum would pray for traveling mercies for me. I just love that saying. Meaning, as Anne Lamott wrote, love the journey, God is with you, come back safe and sound. I think that's a lovely description um, of traveling mercies. And my dad would get out of cloth, he did this every time, and he would clean the headlights, do you call them headlights? Headlights of the car. <laughs> <coughs> as, as I left. And then as I left, he would knock on the roof of the car. What is that about men? They like knocking on the roof of a car when you sort of leave. I've just noticed that. And almost, sorry, I'm going <coughs> to... Please forgive me. I've actually been a bit sick the last couple of days. Just pray and my voice will hold. So anyway, that kind of um, situation, those customs, those habits that they had, it was almost like a blessing for me, and it made me feel um, very loved. Um, since I was last year, um, my five siblings and I, we've actually lost both of our parents, which has been a huge loss for us. But since I've been here as well, I've also known the joy um, of four more grandchildren um, being born. You're going to see two of them in a minute. <coughs> This year, I celebrated a ridic ridiculously big birthday, and I just know you're going to guess which one it is, um, and I think there's a slide there. This was a beach party we had for one of the um, celebrations, maybe, coming up. <coughs> and of course, since that time, we've had the dreaded um, pandemic, um, with all the heartache that that brought but also, in the time since I've been here, I've also known God's travelling mercies. And this morning, we're going to be travelling with two disciples who, after witnessing the pain and the sorrow of Holy Week and the bewilderment of the empty tomb, are now walking from Jerusalem uh, to Emmaus. Actually, I'm just looking. Kevin, would you mind coming and just reading this for me, this, this reading? Sorry, this wasn't rehearsed. Just to save my voice a little bit. Would that be okay? The walk to Emmaus. Uh, which verse is that? Yeah, 29 to the end. Yeah. From, <coughs> from 13 to the end. Yes, to him. Yeah. Okay, it's long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is the scripture, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still long. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened happened there these last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus, was, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, traveling mercies, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> okay, Trevor, I just love that story. It's one of my favorite stories um, in the New Testament. Um, in, it's, I love the stories of Jesus' appearances after the resurrection. Um, in some senses, they are so ordinary. Uh, Philip Yancey wrote, they are so unglamorous. There were no angels in the sky singing choruses, no kings from afar bearing gifts. Jesus showed up in the most ordinary circumstances, a private dinner, a woman weeping in a garden, some fishermen working a lake. There is almost a whimsical quality as if Jesus is enjoying the bird-like freedom of his resurrection body. And here we have this beautiful and incredible account of Jesus walking alongside two forlorn travelers on a road to Emmaus. Some think that this was two men, and I think historically that's how it's been portrayed. Um, but I like to go along with the theory that it was a married couple, that it was Cleopas, it says it was Cleopas, and his wife Mary, who is mentioned as being at the foot of the cross um, in John's account of, of Jesus' death. And they were having a heated discussion, as couples do, <laughs> trying to work out all that had happened over the last three days. They didn't recognize Jesus, which was also the case with the others to whom Jesus had appeared after the resurrection. It seems as if Luke is saying that their eyes were restrained and they were held back from recognizing Jesus. They poured out their confusion to this stranger who seemed to be ignorant of all that had happened in Jerusalem. And they spoke of their shattered dreams. In that reading, it said, we had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. We had hoped. And he listened to them. And he responded piece by piece, explaining the scriptures and addressing their fear and their pain. 
they began to trust him and they said later, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the road? And when they got to their destination, they weren't ready to let this stranger go. And so they urged him to share their evening meal. And then the unbelievable happened. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. He broke it and he handed it to them and they suddenly realized that it was Jesus who was sitting at their table. And then he disappeared. How frustrating must that have been? <laughs> Jesus showed up here in, yes, the most ordinary of circumstances. Two people walking along a road. And yet how mysterious and extraordinary it all was. The theologian N.T. Wright, he describes this story as both a wonderful, unique, spellbinding tale, but also a model for what a great deal of being a Christian from that day to this is all about. The slow, sad dismay at the failure of human hopes, the turning to someone who might or might not, uh, might not help, the discovery that in Scripture, all unexpected, there lay, there lay keys which might unlock the central mysteries and enable us to find the truth. The sudden realization of Jesus himself, present with us, warming our hearts with his truth and showing us himself as the bread that is broken. Certainly to me, uh, this story speaks of our walk in this life which, yes, for the most part, is probably quite unglamorous and ordinary. Well, I'm speaking for myself here. And yet, with God walking alongside us, it can be transformed into the extraordinary. I'm sure we can all think of, of the stories of the ordinary becoming extraordinary. Four years ago, I experienced a moment a little bit like this. Since my husband died, um, there have been family occasions, I'm sure I won't be the only one here that's been bereaved um, this morning, and there have been family occasions, many family occasions, where the huge loss of Derek, my husband, is really keenly felt, um, especially things like weddings and the births of other grandchildren, graduation, grandchildren's Christmas plays, all these things when we are celebrating, of course, but all of us, we just feel that loss and like there's someone, someone missing there. Four years ago, my youngest daughter, Alice, who some of you will know, and her husband, uh, Joe, they were expecting their first child. Um, and Alice went in, she went into labor and she went into hospital. They live about two hours away from me. And I'd gone up there and being the good mother and not wanting to be an interfering mother-in-law, I stayed back at, at Joe and Alice's house and it was a long, long labor. And I thought, surely how much longer can it be? Um, and Alice, bless her, after a long and very difficult labour, eventually um, they rushed her down um, and she had a, a C-section, a caesarean section, which is just so cruel, isn't it, when you've done the long labour? I'm sure that she, some of you will know what that's all about. And so I rushed down to the ward as soon as I knew that the baby had been born. And when I went into the ward, I, just, I looked across, and we have a picture now, um, and of Alice. And as I looked across, I thought... What has she got on? That's a funny kind of gown. Whatever is Alice wearing? They, they do funny things. It, they, it was up north. Sorry, Sam and Rachel. Whatever, whatever has she got on? And as I walked over nearer, I said to Alice, Alice, what have you got on? And she said, it's Dad's T-shirt. <laughs> and you know, as I walked over, it was one of those extraordinary moments and I just whipped out my, my phone and I just took this photo. One of the problems was actually finding baby Thomas, who was there with his little woolly hat on. But as I looked at that, I just felt God um, talk to me. We were missing Derek and she had packed that T-shirt when she went into labour because she wanted something of Derek to be with her the whole of the time. And she'd worn that the whole time. But as I looked at her, um, I just thought, do you know, that speaks of the father's covering for all of us. Her father was with her there, just his T-shirt. But, but for us, it spoke to me of God's protection 
over us. You know, God wants us to be that close to him, as, as close as Thomas is lying on her chest there. God wants us to be that close to him, to hear his heartbeat. And he promises that wherever we go on the journey, that his protection and his covering um, will be with us. I love that Psalm uh, 91, which became very precious to us in England. I'm sure it was the same over here during the pandemic. Um, Psalm 91, and in verse 4, it says, He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Perhaps somebody needs to hear that today, that God wants us to be that close to us and to cover us uh, with his feathers. All of us here, I know, have our own individual stories. And maybe some of you feel like this first thing in the morning, this next clip. Thank you. I think we could, thank you. That's my granddaughter, Gracie. You're doing a wiggle, mummy. Maybe you feel like that first thing in the morning. Maybe you feel more like this, though. <laughs> this is Alice's youngest daughter, Naomi. We just caught a photo. She tried to put her mum's boots on. You know, sometimes in the morning, maybe you just think in the morning, I just cannot do it. It's too hard. These boots are just too heavy. Really, that was just a whole excuse for me to show you my granddaughter, so you know that if you get them. I imagine that some of us will have had plans and dreams that for all sorts of reasons just didn't turn out the way that we had thought they would. I know I have had. And like those two disciples, we may have said, but we had hoped. You know, sometimes for some, just facing the day takes the sheer act of the will. Mary Radmacher, she wrote, Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day, saying, I will try again tomorrow. Maybe you feel like that this morning. Sometimes courage looks like the four ladies in Yorkshire in England, um, who next month will be coming to our post-abortion healing retreat, making themselves vulnerable, sharing the most personal things, their sadnesses and their regrets, sharing their broken dreams, their we-had-hoped moments, their sadness and regrets. My friend and colleague Judy and I will be leading them through um, the weekend, and we, you know, are just ordinary women helping ordinary women. And yet we know that God can make this the most extraordinary time of healing and transformation, because every time we do this, he does. He shows up every time. Please pray for us. Um, I don't know if you know, but this week, I mean, it is all over the world, this has been the National Baby Loss Awareness Week. Um, and uh, on October um, the 17th, here in the Church Cafe, um, I have the privilege of leading a training session for those who would like to learn how to walk alongside those who've experienced baby loss through the pain of abortion. We looked at miscarriage last week. This next Thursday, we're looking at the whole sensitive issue of abortion. And how as a church we can offer a pastoral compassionate response to those for whom it's part of their story. And at the weekend on the 21st we're also holding a miscarriage retreat day. A small retreat for those who've experienced miscarriage just to come along and to share our stories and to work through some of the issues that may have affected us and to come through to a place of, of healing. We had hoped... Faith Baldwin, she wrote, time is a dressmaker specializing in alterations. I think that's so true. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs 19.21. Um, it says there, you can make many plans, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Or as it says in the message, we humans keep brainstorming options and plans, but God's purpose prevails. Just like those early disciples, it can be hard to understand why stuff happens. But it's the nature of life. I'm sure I've spoken about this here before. It's just the stuff of life. 
that hearts and lives get broken. Those of people we love, those of people we'll never meet. The wonderful tailor, Barbara Brown Taylor, at the wonderful... She may have been a tailor. She was also a writer. Barbara Brown Taylor, she wrote, Sometimes the works of God's hands is so evident that you can see it a mile away. And sometimes you have to dust for fingerprints. Isn't that true? I remember in the days after Derek died, God's presence was almost tangible. And I sometimes look back and think, I would love to always have that closeness again. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes, though, we have to dust are for fingerprints. Stress has been defined as an adverse reaction to pressure. But for us, maybe another definition of stress could be stress is forgetfulness. We forget one or more of three things. We forget who God is, loving and compassionate, all-powerful, the almighty. We've been singing that this morning. We forget who we are, God's beloved children, forgiven sinners, indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. And we forget that there is an enemy whose job description is, as Jesus told us in John 10.10, to steal, to kill, and destroy. When we forget these truths, then we become vulnerable. And so like our two travelers, we need to learn from the scriptures to understand more about the character of God and the promises in his word. Because if we only know God by what he does in our lives, we're going to get into trouble. We can chase after experiences and follow men who sometimes get it wrong. They're only human like the rest of us. But it's so important to understand the character of God and to remember who he is. So that when tough times come, and they will, we can commit to his ways because we've already committed to his character, to his love, and to his goodness and his faithfulness. In that words of the worship song we're singing at the minute, all all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. I just love that song. And with David the psalmist, uh, we can remember, um, as he said in Psalm 103, oh my soul, bless God, don't forget a single blessing. He forgives your sins, everyone. He heals your diseases, everyone. He redeems you from hell, saves your life. He crowns you with love and mercy, a paradise crown. He wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal, just like that (laughs) T-shirt. He renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. I actually like that bit of the psalm. When Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them, their eyes were opened And later in verse 35, we read, then the two from Emmaus told the story of how Jesus had opened opened the scripture to them as they walked along the way. Through my own experiences of grief in my life, I've come to learn uh, that God reaches broken people through broken people. You know, we live in a broken world and maybe this morning we feel a little bit broken. I love this piece of writing by Brian Draper. He wrote, the rabbi comes, the pupil comes to the rabbi and asks, why does the Torah tell us to place these holy words on our hearts? The rabbi answers, it's because as we are, our hearts are closed and we cannot place the holy words in our hearts. So we place them on top of our hearts and there they stay until one day the heart breaks and the words fall in. It's often the case that our own breakthroughs seem to happen when we ourselves break open. Certainly, some of the more spiritually mature people I've known have gone through a disintegration of sorts. In the process, they've become more soulfully connected to life somehow. Their words may sometimes be fewer, but any they do care to speak arise from deeper down within those opened hearts. I just love that. You know, sometimes when we have questions without easy answers, such as in loss or bereavement or all the other things that might happen to us along this journey of life, when we're dusting for his fingerprints, it is then that God's word and his promises become so precious and so true. When those words that may have rested gently on our hearts fall a little further into place. 
and become so precious. So we've talked about the ordinary, but what about the extraordinary? On the road to Emmaus, the stranger opens the traveller's eyes to God's words, and bit by bit, things begin to make sense. When we invite Jesus into our lives, into our situations, bit by bit, things come together. We begin to see a bigger plan, God's plan. We see life from an eternal perspective, and not just from our own little world. Perhaps today there are some here who need to invite Jesus again into their lives to help, help them see things from his perspective. N.T. Wright suggests that in this account, Luke seems to be reminding us of the story of Genesis 3, when a couple, Adam and Eve, ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they saw that they were naked. Everything had gone wrong. But now in this story, Luke is saying that there is another couple. Here is another couple whose eyes were suddenly opened. And they saw Jesus. N.T. Wright says, This is a moment of cosmic healing where the great story of the world has turned on its hinge and is moving in a new direction. Here is a blueprint for the church, a people whose hearts are warmed by the unfolding of the scriptures and whose eyes are open to recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. I can sometimes, actually lots of times, uh, despair about the state of the world today. And we only have to be, I've been watching CNN news here this morning, just, and I know we're all in prayer for the situation in Israel and in Gaza and, and the situation in Ukraine, the world is in a very, very sad state. And sometimes it can be so easy um, to despair about that. But there is joy. There's sorrow, but there is joy as well. And just like Gracie in that video, we can dance to the beat of God's heart. Jesus is alive. <laughs> We've already sang, we sang about six feet under, there's a rumbling this morning. We just sang that song, Jesus is alive, there was a resurrection. We know the end of God's greater plan. I just want to read, by, uh, to finish by reading you um, a, a poem by the poet Gerard Kelly. I, I'm pretty sure I've read this here before, but I'm going to do it again because I love it and I think it's just so relevant. And Gerard Kelly um, uh, just imagines uh, the verse, Revelations 21.3, when it says, Look, God's home is among his people, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or crying or sorrow or pain. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward um, to that day this morning. Gerard Kelly imagined it like this. What could happen when the old order of our culture passes away and a new order emerges? God's kingdom here on earth, the truly extraordinary. He writes, it was eight o'clock on Monday morning and I saw a new, a new city coming down from the heavens. I saw a teenager leaping out of bed with joy. That's got to be a picture of heaven, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Laughing with the freshness of the morning. I saw elderly ladies skipping down the road. Bring it on. I saw children paddling in the local river. I saw a football match in the park, and the teams were mixed people from every people group. Asylum seekers and taxi drivers, policemen and prisoners, pensioners and politicians. I saw a street party where people were eating and dancing because there was hope again. And as I looked across, I saw a community of hope, a community of grace, a community of warmth. And in the clearness of the morning, I looked and there was no more asthma, no more unwanted pregnancies, no more debt, no more violence, no more overcrowding, and nobody was too busy. <laughs> How amazing would that be? The rivers were flowing with crystal clear water. There were no more needles and drugs in the park, no more sorrow of family breakdown, no more poverty, no more need, no more unemployment or mind-numbing jobs, no more hopelessness, no more sadness, only joy and laughter. 
The dividing walls were gone. Families and neighbors were restored. There was no more rubbish, no dealers, no knives. There were no racial tensions, just one harmonious mix in technicolor. And I looked and saw homes without locks on the doors where a welcome was always guaranteed. I saw a place where families eat and play together. I saw a place where tears were wiped away. This is the hope, the hope that we have um, this morning. So traveling mercies, love the journey. God is with you. Come home safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you.